Well, hello, Nativity Bibleheads. It is Dr. Wayne, and it is time for uh, Lectionary Power Bible Study. Uh, we are now in the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany um, for uh, January 30th, and uh, we have passages from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Uh, the psalm is 70, Psalm number 71, verses 1 through 6, and the famous love chapter from uh, 1 Corinthians 13, and then um, a continuation of last week's narrative in Luke, on, uh, in Luke chapter 4, uh, starting in verses 21, going to 30. Um, now, in our Nativity worship this week, uh, we have our annual meeting, so uh, there won't be any sermon. Uh, it'll be the, uh, the rector's report. Um, this isn't going to stop me from talking about the lectionary text. We're still going to read them in worship. And it is uh, incumbent upon me to somehow find a connection into the realities that we, which we live in, yes? Um, the, uh, the epiphany, remember, we all know what the word epiphany means, right? Manifestation, realization, some sort of a disclosure, some sort of a revelation, an apocalypse even. That's what apocalypse means, to mean, be an uncovering. That which is veiled is uncovered. An epiphany is that kind of thing where it's a, a, a showing um, a, and all of a sudden, ta-da, there it is, kind of a thing. In uh, the book of Jeremiah, uh, we uh, are pulling from his very first chapter. In it, uh, Jeremiah is receiving his uh, call experience. In chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. Okay, so uh, when we have um, these call narratives uh, from, uh, from the prophets, they, there, there is typically a... Uh, a statement of uh, the Lord, like basically saying, okay, now I know what I'm doing here. <laughs> and um, and uh, there's always a, uh, an initial um, say, saying, okay, this is, this is what you're gonna be doing. And there is typically a retort or a protest from the prophet saying, um, wait, what? Are you sure? Um, have you, you sure? You sure we don't have the wrong number here? That kind of a thing. Um, so in Jeremiah's case, he says, for I'm only a boy. Now, the, the word for boy there uh, represents, uh, it's not, it doesn't represent so much gender as it does youth. Um, the idea that he's uh, younger than, uh, it's like, when you think of prophets, you don't think of uh, young people typically, right? Well, um, it just so happens that we know of uh, Jeremiah having a very long uh, ministry, a very long um, uh, time of uh, him doing his prophecy, uh, almost like a 40-year period. Uh, so, um, yeah, we do expect that, uh, uh, we're not surprised, shall I say, that he, it comes to him when he still considers himself a boy. We don't know exactly what that means, um, but... Maybe to say that I'm only a boy is to say that it was like, maybe it was before his mitzvah. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, anyway, the narrative continues after this a protest. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you to deliver you. So, says the Lord. So, um, Jeremiah encounters in his, um, in his ministry, um, he, he's going to be one of, the, one of those prophets of doom uh, in, in Judah, okay? He's from a, a, a town that's like three miles from Jerusalem. So, he's from the southern kingdom and he is tasked with actually um, speaking to the king about the ill that uh, the nation has done that merits, 
um, being taken over. Um, during um, during um, uh, Jeremiah's ministry, he talks of um, them, you know, being overtaken. He gets accused of being, uh, if you will, unpatriotic because he says that, well, we know we can't just play on the fact that we are, you know, God's chosen people. Um, we mess things up and uh, we've got to pay. There's going to be a pay off. We are going to end up um, being overtaken. And um, this was not a popular thing to say. Um, uh, when God gives the prophet these words, uh, he's basically saying, um, you're going to be perceived as not playing the game that everybody wants to see played. Um, you're going to be considered uh, a traitor even. Um, uh, um, we will encounter, if, if, you, if you read the book of Jeremiah all the way to the end, um, there's uh, the confrontations with, there's other prophets around. There's other prophets saying, oh, everything's gonna be great, everything's gonna be fine. And uh, they're the ones that get uh, the accolades and Jeremiah is left saying the truth and getting the shaft, if you will. Um, such is the way that that goes with um, people who dare to speak truth to power, yes? Um, so when um, he says, you know, do not, do not say I'm only before you shall go to all whom I send you. So like the idea is that, you know what, I, you don't, it doesn't matter whether you're a boy or not, it doesn't matter about your, because you're gonna do, you're, it's like I'm your leader in this, okay? God is saying, the Lord is saying to Jeremiah, um, uh, follow my lead, okay? Um, uh, you are my, in my, um, it's like the God is the general and you're, the, you're just the buck private. You just basically have to t go to what, it, and, and you don't have to worry about what you're gonna say because I'm gonna tell you what to say, okay? Don't be afraid, for I am with you to deliver you. And those are, though, that is a warning to Jeremiah. Okay, now, what you're going to say is not going to be pleasing to people. People are going to get upset, and um, they're going to want to destroy you. Um, don't be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. Now, that can't be a word of assurance. Um, uh, you would hope it would, right? Like, yeah, I'll be like, but what do you mean I shouldn't be afraid of them and you'll be with me to deliver me? What does that, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, well, what it means is they're going to try to kill you, okay? Uh, so, uh, yeah, Jeremiah, if he were fearful about, of this uh, kind of uh, rhetoric, um, it's rightful that he should be so, okay? All right, um, then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. Ooh, that's quite a way to say that. Uh, um, we've, we've got to know that, uh, the, that he's speaking metaphorically here. We know that the Lord does not have arms or hands or shoulders or even a body, right? So um, for him to uh, paint this picture it is a, a poetic way, if you will, of saying you know, that um, there's a commissioning going on, okay? Um, we have the, uh, the um, expression, the Christian expression of putting the hands, uh, you know, either on the, on the head or on the shoulders or, or what have you. Um, the, any, that idea of connection, there's a commissioning in that. In this, uh, in this uh, commissioning, here's the words, here are the words that, that come to him. Now I have put my words in your mouth. Remember, he put his hand and touched his mouth. Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Remember, Jeremiah has a message that's not popular. Jeremiah has a message that uh, speaks to people in a way that um, pisses them off, okay? It's like, really? You're not on our side? You're not, you're not saying good stuff about, our, about our, our nation, about our country? How dare you? Well, this is the plight of the prophet. Um, but um, he's going to pluck up, to pull out, to destroy and overthrow, to build, to plant. 
So not only does he have a message of, of destruction, he also has a message of building up. Um, in his teachings, uh, if you were to read Jeremiah much uh, into it past the first chapter, and in fact, there's a lot, there's a lot. Jeremiah is a super long book. You will find that it's not all gloom and doom. He creates a context for all of the ill that happens to Israel. Remember, this is the sixth century, okay? This is when um, they get overtaken by, uh, by the Babylonians. This is when they get exiled up into Babylon. And um, he goes into exile. Um, and he also is the one who is saying, hey, this isn't the end. This is not the end. This, uh, this is just the beginning of something God is doing. God is actually working through everything. In fact, God is causing everything, all of this bad stuff. God is actually making it happen so that we can then experience his love even better because there's circumstances, okay? It's not a punishment reward thing. What it is is when we're given great responsibility, we are, there's expectations, and we are supposed to respond in such a way that we take responsibility. We don't want to just look around us and say, oh, woe is me. It's just horrible, everything that's happening to us. Well, what, how am I being at cause for my circumstances? What decisions, choices have I made? What, you know, what have I done that can bring this ill? What, we have to look at ourselves, not as a way of blaming, but as a way of being cause in the matter. The being cause in the matter. The, the idea that, um, that, that um, yeah, I got circumstances, but um, I've made choices that made those circumstances untenable, right? So if I am willing to look at those, if I am willing to take on responsibility for my situation, I can actually then, from a powerful position, choose something different, something beyond. This is the message of uh, Jeremiah. Um, that's the, as far as our passage goes today. But um, in, the, in the realm of epiphany, in the realm of you know, showing forth uh, God's glory, I believe that um, this call experience of Jeremiah uh, teaches us a couple of things. One is that uh, God works to show himself through people who are willing to say things that are not popular, okay? Uh, we don't like to listen to people uh, who we disagree with, but we have to sometimes if we're really going to get the reality of, uh, you know, of the reality that we've, we've created for ourselves. Now, um, also, epiphany in terms of, okay, Jeremiah here, this is a per personal epiphany, if you will, right? Uh, a personal uh, a realization of, of, of who God is, of what God is about, of what God is doing, and what uh, he needs to be doing in response to what God has been doing. So um, that's how I'm tying this into the, the, uh, the, the season of Epiphany. Um, the Psalm, we take a portion of Psalm 71, verses 1 through 6. In you, O Lord, and I'm reading from the uh, Book of Common Prayer uh, version. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge? Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Um, uh, the, um, the, the, the Lord is oftentimes seen as this, this rock, this, 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 this uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you were to look at a, a, a mountainside or a, a, a cliff or a rocky, you know, uh, encumbrance in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the wilderness, you know, that kind of a thing, and the crevices and the crags and things are like, oh, there's places you can hide to, uh, to avoid um, uh, trouble. Um, uh, that's the way they, they look at that sometimes, Okay. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. See, the idea, almost like, like it's like we're climbing the rock, okay? And we're, we're looking for these places of refuge, these, these crevices in the rock. This is the way the psalmist uh, looks upon it. Deliver me 
my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the clutches of the evildoer and the oppressor. Now, it's very likely that um, uh, these, this metaphorical uh, speaking of, you know, like you're like a rock climber who's, uh, who's uh, you know, on the precipice, um, uh, that this is that is very likely this is the real situation that there is some some sort of threat that the psalmist is um, is experiencing, and, and that's the reason why he would uh, exclaim them as the, the, the evil doer or oppressor. For you are my hope, O Lord God, my confidence since I was young. Can you see how this kind of uh, dovetails? Remember, the psalm frequently is attempting to play on the sentiment or emotion, uh, the vibe, if you will, that we get from the uh, Old Testament lesson, the first lesson, and that's what we have here. If you can see how uh, you might think of this as Jeremiah saying that, okay? I'm not saying he is saying this, but I'm hoping you can see how he could, right? For you are my hope, O Lord God, my confidence since I was young. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength. My praise shall be always of you. So um, in uh, the, uh, the strain of epiphany of God manifesting God's self, um, in that promise of, uh, uh, and commissioning of, of work to be done, there's also the promise of uh, the, 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 the comfort that we can receive in knowing that God is always with us, okay? Um, uh, this thing about my, from my mother's womb, you've always been my strength, you know, and you saw that thing in, in Jeremiah 1, uh, 4, where it says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, okay? So um, these, are the, these are the connections that have um, us uh, put the this, this psalm with this, um, with this uh, first reading, and also, this is where people get the argument for um, uh, the anti the uh, the uh, the anti-abortion movement. You know, because they they see the, uh, uh, things like this, and this is supposed to be the reason why uh, one of the reasons why uh, the the life in the womb is uh, is uh, to be preserved um, uh, and what have you. This is one of those. Uh, this is one of those. Uh, uh, places in scripture that they will point to. And, um, and I hope you can see that uh, if we are talking about epiphany, if we're talking about uh, the manifestation of God, the showing of God, uh, God, uh, you know, realizing God's power in the world, um, that uh, in the time, in a time of, of, um, uh, of uh, ex extreme danger for ourselves, we would turn to God and say, hey, oh yes, yes, you've always known me. I've never, you've never not known me. It's, it's as though um, th what the psalmist is trying to do is ex exclaim that the, uh, is trying to say like, I'm not just some Johnny come lately. Uh, this is, we've always been uh, one and I'm d declaring that to you now. And uh, sometimes that's a part of the human experience of, uh, of uh, exclaiming connection with God when, uh, when we realize that we're in danger and then we, we kind of like play our greatest hits, if you will. We, we go back and say, oh, but oh, remember me? We've, and uh, and we are, you've heard of people's lives flashing before their eyes. Well, um, sometimes in the experience of, of um, us you know, being um, uh, in danger, we will say, well, uh, in, in our prayer to God, you know, it's not unusual for us to then to, to recite, hey, hey, you were with me in this time and that time and this time and that time. And, and yes, all the way back to the womb. This is what the psalmist is reaching back for. And it's a very human experience of, of saying, hey, um, we've always been t tight. And so um, let's not let that pass by, even though it feels, uh, things feel tenuous right now. This is where the scripture is going with that. Okay, we're moving on to the uh, New Testament passages. Our second lesson is from uh, uh, Paul's first letter to uh, the Corinthians, and it's this famous love chapter, right? Love chapter, chapter 13. Um, if you were to look at, and we have been over the last couple of weeks uh, in uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, um, Paul's been talking about spiritual gifts, 
He's been talking about the gifts of people in the body of Christ. And um, uh, last week's reading was, you know, he, all about the, the fact that um, doesn't matter what your gift is, it's important in the body of, uh, of, of Christ in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the life of the church. Now, the, one of the main problems that, he was, that he's addressing in the book of 1 Corinthians is the fact that um, the, the spiritual gift of glossolalia, the, the tongue speaking, has become a bit of a um, flashpoint, if you will. And so he's been trying to reach for and expand people's ideas of like, there's a whole lot of things that are a whole lot better uh, the, and edifying and useful to the community than, than, than glossolalia, than, than tongue speaking. And so in chapter 13, this is where he really tries to uh, go another direction and open their world up to something much bigger than tongue speaking. And here is what he says. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, see, so there he said, uh, like, he's really trying to get people to get the context of it. He's like saying, you know, that might be flashy, that might be uh, something that people put a lot of value on, but guess what? Um, if I don't have love, if, I, if I'm not in the right mindset of that, if I'm not motivated from a position of love, and love is where God is all the time, remember this, so it's like, wow, okay. Um, maybe I need to rethink uh, my motivations in this and enter that. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, which means, and not have the attitude of Christ, the attitude of God, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You might as well just be, Rah! it doesn't make any difference is what he's saying. So the thing about love here, I want us to get it as he keeps talking about it and he, and he, and he, he continues to harp on it is the fact that he's describing the way Christ is. He's describing the way God is with regard to us. And in, uh, uh, and in all reality, he's describing divinity in its, in its essence. And when we uh, strive for this kind of divinity, it makes these other things much less important. Here we go. Verse two, and if I have uh, prophetic powers, you know, prophecy, that was one of those, the gifts he talked about, and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, see, faith was at one of the gifts also, um, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, and do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and uh, there are gifts of, um, uh, gifts of mercy, where you uh, know what needs to be had and you meet that need. And if I hand over my body so that I may boast, see, Paul knows about what this is like because he's had, he's had to, well, think about it. Um, did not Jesus give over his body? Yes, he did. Did Paul suffer as well bodily for his faith? Yes, he did. But do not have love, I gain nothing. So even in these motivations, the, the, uh, if, if, our, if love isn't the motivation in our practicing of those gifts, those abilities that we've been given, it makes no difference, okay? Paul is trying to say. Love is patient, okay? And every time he has this word love, you gotta think about, he's talking about divinity here. He's talking about Christ. He's talking about God, okay? He's talking about the Lord. He's talking about the way we're supposed to aim for in, in mimicking and being like God. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And if you think about it, yes, you look at the life of Christ. This describes 
This describes the life of Christ, okay? This describes exactly how Jesus conducted his ministry. This, is, this describes exactly how Jesus uh, went about doing everything that he did, uh, his, his entire, uh, all of his teachings, all of his work endures all things. Remember, yes, okay? Even, yes, even the cross. So if Paul is trying to say that, you know, you, so you think that these gifts that you have that make you, they bring you closer. Well, let's just see. Let's just see how close do you think you are being to the way that Jesus was in your way of being? How, to what degree are you really being that, okay? Are you really enduring all things? Are you, are you really being that um, believing, that hopeful, uh, that, that bearing of all this is what Jesus did. Let's raise the bar, okay? Verse eight, love never ends. God never ends. Christ never ends, right? Um, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. See, there we go. The tongues, these are the gifts. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. That's another one of those gifts, okay? For we know only in part. See, again, this is like, okay, this gift is just a partial gift. And we prophesy only in part. This gift is also a partial gift. But when the complete comes, oh, the partial will come to an end. That's what happens in the Christ event. The complete comes. We've seen the complete. We've seen this, uh, this flash of, oh, this is, this is the goal of God with regard to the life of humanity. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. So we shouldn't be so rejoiceful about our partial uh, manifestations of that. Um, they're all just, just, just a glimpse, just a glimpse. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Paul, I believe, is saying the same thing of, of the Corinthians, those who are putting a value on a certain kind of a gift, saying that's all childish, okay? This is the way we think when we're children. We put values like that that, uh, that tend to segregate and tend to uh, divide. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror. You see, um, uh, uh, there's always this process of growing up, right? We always talk about, you know, being spiritual, a spiritual baby or a spiritual adult, you know, like, gotta grow up. That's one of the things I love about the Episcopal Church, I believe, is that what we get in the Episcopal Church is a church for grown-ups, okay? Um, it's, uh, there's plenty of churches out there, and I've been in them when I, growing up, uh, that are for, you know, people, you know, spiritual babes, uh, but, um, the Episcopal Church is a church for grown-ups, and we've got to get to a space of uh, seeing who God is fully, as opposed to keep uh, as to uh, and put away our childish ideas of who God uh, is. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. Okay, that idea there. Um, uh, uh, the word dimly is actually the word riddle, in a riddle, in a mirror, in a riddle, in a mirror. What's, ooh, that's interesting. Uh, mirrors uh, that back then were very cloudy, okay? They weren't, uh, they weren't like we see today where we look in a mirror and it's like, oh, I'm, I'm looking exactly what people are saying. No, uh, mirrors were cloudy and they were foggy and so that's why it says in a mirror, uh, in a riddle. Okay, um, it's like we just, we don't, ha we have a cloudy understanding, okay? That's the idea of mirror. Mirror isn't uh, exact like it is now. Uh, uh, but then we will see it face to face, okay? Uh, in this reality that we live in today, it's an incomplete reality. It's not a complete reality. That's the thing about. Um, that's the reason why we experience um, evil in the world. This is why we experience uh, bad things is because we are incomplete beings, okay? Um, Christ uh, lived as one who was complete 
uh, and uh, over against us, uh, we can't help but be found wanting, yes? But then we will see face to face. The idea is like, oh, whatever that dim, whatever that cloudiness is, it's going to clear up, okay? As we grow into the uh, into adulthood, okay, we get that that cloudiness goes away. Adulthood. Now I know only in part, okay, as a child. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. We've got to continue to strive to get rid of the clouds to get to get more definition in what we're seeing. And now, faith. Hope and love abide. They stay, they remain, okay? These things, these three, that's all, the only thing that, that, but the greatest of these is love, okay? That's because love is that metaphor uh, which describes uh, who God is. So um, uh, this, what, I mean, what else is there to, to be said about all this? So love is something, yes, it's something that we are, it's something that we do, it's something we strive for. This is what we find manifested in who God is for us. And um, if, if what we're feeling is some sort of, and if it's not love, guess what? It's not of God, okay? And um, if we're ever thinking about a certain amount of, of certain people and saying, well, good and drink it, there's, well, guess what? Um, if, if, that, if it's not of love, then, um, then you, who are you being in, in, in that, right? Um, this is difficult to take because it challenges the way we approach people. It challenges us to look at people the way God looks at people, the way Jesus cares for people, the way, you know, especially when we say, Jesus loves me, this I know. Well, maybe does he love everybody the way, if I'm loving, am I loving everybody the way Jesus is loving everybody? This is supposed to make us really take a look at ourselves. And that is all I'm going to say on 1 Corinthians 13 today. Now, we're moving on. Luke chapter 4. Like I told you, we don't get a, we don't get a sermon on the, on, the, on the text today. We get the rector's annual, annual report. Um, so um, this is going to be it. So this is going to be it. So uh, maybe I'm getting a little preachy. Uh, maybe that's why I'm doing that is because of, because of that. Okay, so Luke chapter four, uh, verses 21 to 30. Now, um, I preached on uh, Luke chapter four last week and uh, the passage ended with the, um, the, the, the verses that begin uh, this week's uh, uh, message where it says, in the synagogue at Nazareth, Jesus read from the book of the prophet Isaiah and began to say, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That was that's how it, that's how uh, that's how last week's uh, passage ended, and then this is where this week's passage begins. All spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. Um, so they start. It starts out with, "Oh, that's pretty good stuff," <laughs> and they said, "Is not this Joseph's son?" And so it starts out that way, and it kind of start goes into like, well, isn't that, isn't this Joseph's son? Could be read to say either, who the heck, is, who does he think he, is? or it could be said like, oh yeah, this is Joseph's son, and, and it could be. He said to them, um, all spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. And they said to him, they said, is not this Joseph's son? Um, some people read that as expression of doubt. Um, it's hard to say for sure. It could just be an expression of, of eh, one way or the other. Uh, either, it depends on what you think of Joseph, right? Oh, isn't this Joseph's son? Oh, isn't this Joseph's son? It just depends on who you are as to whether or not it's, it's being uh, a compliment, right? He said to them, uh, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb. Dr. Cure yourself. Now, um, this is probably something from, uh, this is not biblical, okay? This is something that comes from, uh, it's the proverb, right? Um, uh, Our statements of wisdom that don't necessarily have anything to do with God. They're just statements of wisdom, statements of, of common sense, okay? Um, that kind of thing. And you will say, do here also in your hometown 
the things that we heard you did at Capernaum. Now, Capernaum, uh, remember, uh, was where Jesus, uh, it was like the headquarters of his ministry. And um, uh, Capernaum uh, was a place where it was less uh, Jewish uh, than his hometown of Nazareth. And um, yeah, so uh, Jesus uh, points to the fact that um, there might be a certain expectation um, in, in his hometown. But he knows that um, that's, that those expectations uh, have a reality. And, and he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, okay, this is just merely a pointing out of like, anytime it's somebody that's homegrown, it's hard to hear that they actually have a word from God, especially if it's a challenging word because it's like, oh yeah, he's one of us, he's one of us. Uh, and sometimes when you're, you're considered one of us, you can't hear the words of challenge, okay? But look at this. Jesus quotes a couple of things from the books of Kings, of, of, the, of the Kings. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. And when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, there was a severe famine over the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. Okay, if you were to read this passage, um, it points to the fact that this prophet of God uh, in, uh, uh, ministers to this non-Jewish woman, and uh, there were lots of people who were suffering from it, but yet, God demonstrates care for those who are impacted, uh, uh, you know, outside the community of faith. This is something that when people hear it, they think, well, okay, God went to the non-chosen people instead of us. Well, yeah, that happened. I, we read that. There were also, and he points to this, but there were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, also in the book of Kings, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. <laughs> Again, he points out how in times of distress that God's spokesperson, God's minister, went to a people who were not amongst the chosen, so to speak, right? Um, the, 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 the thought here is Jesus is saying, um, there's evidence in our own past of, of God um, uh, wanting to do something much bigger than the people are ready to accept. And such is the case with Jesus' own ministry the fact that the people weren't going to accept him because uh, Jesus knew that a, a large part of his ministry was to go to the Gentiles, right? And so it wasn't just about um, preaching to the, to the choir. It was about making it a universal uh, community of faith, especially in the time of, uh, 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 in a time when um, there was a lot of uh, wanting to be separate uh, because of, of like, we, oh, we're not with them, they're not us. Or, we hate them and you can't hate them unless you're with us or you can't be with us unless you hate them, that kind of a thing. Jesus is saying, uh, my ministry is much bigger than, uh, you've give, than you might want to give me credit. It's kind of like he's saying, we're not special. People don't like to hear that. Um, it's one thing to be called and chosen. That means we've been chosen for service. We've been chosen for a duty. We've been given a task, similar to the way Jeremiah was given a task, yes? This doesn't put us in a space of privilege. This doesn't make us special. This makes us more accountable to what it is that God is actually wanting to get done. So. If you think that being amongst God's chosen means that that gives you more privilege, more status, oh, status, oh, didn't Paul deal with that in the love passages as well? Yes, he did. It's like, well, think again, think again. 
That's not what the point is. What happens here when, uh, uh, after Jesus says this? When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. Yeah, why rage? Because they, they realized, oh, um, um, he's ragging on us. He's telling that we're, we've got some work to do. So what did they do? They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. We don't know exactly the details of this. This is typical of the way um, uh, Luke's narratives go. Uh, whenever we come to a, um, a, 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 a physical confrontation, we don't get details. Uh, we didn't get it in the birth, we didn't get it in the crucifixion, we don't get it here. Uh, but we do have um, tales in the Old Testament, in the first, uh, in, the, in the books of the kings, of um, the prophets Elijah, Elisha, encountering um, difficulty and uh, getting the riles up from the people. And in the end, he uh, uh, comes through it unscathed. This is not unusual. Uh, so, Luke is painting Jesus in that vein of like the prophets um, Elijah and Elisha, whereby they brought the horrible, um, the, the, the painful truth, if you will, to the people. And the people's response is not something that is just, oh, isn't this wonderful? Oh, we love this. Oh, we feel, feel so convicted in our hearts. No, they don't. They get angry. And this is a reaction that can come from people for whom the message is intended. It's not the intention to pull it out, but we need to realize that when we're being convicted in our hearts of our own uh, compliance with evil or our own um, reticence to, uh, to, to, to uh, embrace the good that, that God wants to give us, um, uh, we're going to be dealing with some stuff and uh, some people will respond to it uh, in, with violence and some people respond to it in different ways. But still, the challenge is still very, uh, very real and, and, and the kind of reaction that it produces in us is something that uh, we've got to be uh, ready to do some work around because if we're not willing to do the work, you, you know what? Things might not go so well. Um, so this is something we want to uh, keep in mind. And in the world of epiphany, Jesus here is manifesting, revealing that God's plan, God's picture, God's plan of salvation is for much, uh, a much bigger picture than what we want to necessarily allow for it to be. And that our minds are sometimes in these grooves that don't allow uh, an opening for uh, this kind of an input. Uh, sometimes we, we, we try to, uh, we, we expect to hear a certain thing because we don't want to be challenged so much as we just want to be confirmed. We want to be affirmed in, in, in this, the place where we are. And what Jesus does is blows that up and we, can, we have our choice then of how we're gonna respond. This is the lesson for this week and I hope that um, you will find something in it uh, that uh, blesses you and by the, you know, forward this to, to somebody else who's like, oh, Father Wayne has, uh, has something really good to say about the scripture passages this week, even though we don't get to hear much about it because of the fact that it's the annual report uh, type, uh, uh, annual meeting Sunday. Um, but um, we, that doesn't necessarily, we should take a Sunday off from uh, spiritual growth and from uh, learning more about ourselves and about how we can serve God in the world. Now does it. Until next week, peace.